embark upon the great crusades toward which we have striven these many months. In the whole history of war, never has so much depended on the outcome of a single day. It was the climax of World War II. That was the one moment when things could have been gone either way. June 6th, 1944, D-Day. The great gamble that shaped the 20th century. We were landed and we weren't going anywhere. We were going to do or die sort of thing. Three armies storm the Normandy coast and one of them fights for Canada. I was part of the greatest armada the world had ever seen. I was part of that. We made history that day. Tehran, November 1943. The leaders of Great Britain and the United States welcome a new ally, the Russian communist Joseph Stalin. They are now the big three, and the new partner is impatient. For two and a half years, the Russians have borne the brunt of the war against Nazi Germany, and they are near exhaustion. So the Russian position is absolutely consistent. The Western allies are not doing enough. Sideshows in the Mediterranean aren't enough. The bombing offensive isn't enough. The only thing that will tie down significant German resources is the invasion of France. Stalin gets his wish, and plans are laid for Operation Overlord. The great invasion is to be commanded by General Dwight Eisenhower, an exceptional soldier he also has the crafty skills of a diplomat. Oh, it's a mistake to think that my father didn't have an ego. He had an ego the size of a house. It's just that he was able to see other points of view and submerge his ego that he was successful. Eisenhower must tread carefully with both Winston Churchill and Britain's top soldier. Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. For despite the show of solidarity, there are tensions in the Allied camp. While the Americans push to launch the invasion as soon as possible, Britain is determined to wait. Churchill wanted to make sure that the, uh, the situation was ripe. And for the situation to be ripe, we had to have command of the air, we had to have command of the sea, and we had to have enough troops and equipment in England to ensure a successful landing. By the spring of 1944, Churchill's conditions have been met. The sea lanes supplying England are open, and Britain looks ready to sink under the weight of men and equipment. On the Russian front, Hitler's armies are in retreat. In Europe, Canadian, British and American troops have taken Sicily and are fighting their way up the Italian boot. Germany knows the invasion of France cannot be far off. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel has thought of little else for months. Since taking charge of the coastal defenses of France at the beginning of the year, Rommel has turned the Channel coast into a 400-mile-long killing zone. The Germans have poured millions of yards of concrete, strung barbed wire by the mile, and laid mines at the rate of more than a million a month. The tidal flats are studded with spikes of concrete and steel.
The Germans knew that there was going to be an attack. In a sense, there's no possibility of strategic surprise in 1944. What you hope for is operational surprise. You, you, you land at the place where they don't expect you on a day when they don't expect you. That's the best you can hope for. Rommel has concentrated his defenses in the Pas de Calais. It is the shortest route from England and the most likely place for the Allied invasion. In fact, the Allies have no intention of landing at Calais. The invasion target is farther along the north coast, at the base of the Cherbourg Peninsula, the beaches of Normandy. It will mean a longer and more dangerous crossing, but the German defenses here are less formidable. Now the Allies begin an elaborate game of deception called Operation Fortitude. It's designed to convince the Germans they're right, that the Pas de Calais is the real target. We had a false army in England. By false, I mean an army created through radio traffic, an army created through uh, false campgrounds, airfields, uh, gliders uh, sitting in fields and all that sort of thing, as if we were going to use these forces that didn't exist on the Pas de Calais. This phantom army is called the first U.S. Army Group, and nothing about it is real. Most of the tents are empty, the landing craft all fakes, and the tanks are made of rubber. They're simply props manufactured by American and British movie crews. To cap off the deception, this bogus army is led by a real live general, George Patton. Now the question comes up, uh, why Patton was selected as the, uh, the dummy, the man who wasn't there, the, the fictitious commander of a first army group. Well, the fact is that the Germans knew our order of battle pretty well. And the Germans, uh, possibly through mythology, like our fixation on Rommel, feared Patton worse than they feared anybody else. Patton dutifully travels around southern England making public appearances, all of which are carefully reported by German spies. Operation Fortitude deceives the Germans into believing that Allied strength is nearly twice what it really is, and that therefore, with so many troops, the Allies can afford to launch a real invasion and a diversionary attack as well. It was essential that Hitler be convinced that uh, the Pas de Calais was going to be the main effort because he had a reserve. He had a reserve that he uh, withheld from Rommel, who was commanding uh, in the Normandy area. Uh, he withheld that reserve until really too late, all due to fortitude. Incredible, just an incredible success, uh, an incredible victory before we even landed in Normandy. With just two months to go before D-Day, British, American, and Canadian troops begin full-out dress rehearsals all over England and Scotland. Most have already been training for an amphibious assault for nearly a year. We actually trained took commando type training. We scaled cliffs, we fought along bombed out streets in Southampton from building to building. There was a five mile run before breakfast every morning. There uh, we had to do a 10 mile march, a 10 mile run uh, every week. And then to cap it all off, we had to do a 50 mile force march, full equipment uh, within 18 hours. We knew all our weapons inside and out. 
We'd advance behind uh, creeping barrages within 100 yards of them with the shrapnel from our own shells coming back past us. And uh, we, we were highly trained. We'd heard all the sounds and all the smells of battle except the death. Every training exercise is designed to mirror in detail the assault they know is coming somewhere, sometime soon. We were putting all our eggs in one basket. The cross-channel invasion of Europe had to go, and the consequences, if it did not go, were so great that uh, nobody even gave it a thought. Nobody even made any contingency plans uh, for failure. In May 1944, the soldiers and sailors of the Allied Expeditionary Force begin massing in southern England. Huge camps spring up to house nearly two million soldiers, the largest military force ever assembled. It was a tremendous operation, and the equipment and supplies and all that sort of thing that were needed to sustain the assault, once it was successful, uh, boggles the mind. Uh, one thinks in terms of square miles of tanks, of stores, of ammunition, of every conceivable piece of equipment you can imagine. You know, they just went as far as the eye could see. Thousands of ships of every size and shape begin to appear in English ports. By D-Day, they will form the greatest armada the world has ever seen. 5,300 ships in all. And my wife was in Bournemouth, and she, she told me after, she says, she was right on the coast in Bournemouth. She says, we looked, and we could see, couldn't see water for ships. We thought, something's happening. For General Eisenhower, the month of May is filled with anxiety. He is terrified that a security leak now will sink Operation Overlord before it is even launched. There was an awful scare just a week before the attack when an operation order blew out the window. Twelve copies blew out the window of the headquarters. My God, they went and scraped up 11 of them. And there was one missing. And uh, finally, a citizen came off the street and handed it to the guard. The secret never got out. I think it was miraculous. On the last day of May, at ports all over southern England, ships are loading. It takes four full days to get the men, their equipment, and vehicles on board. D-Day is to be June 5th. The ocean will be at mid-tide, a compromise that allows the landing craft to avoid many of the beach obstacles, but will force the assault troops to cover half the tidal flat out in the open, easy targets. A full moon the night before will mean the paratroopers jumping in behind German lines do not land in total darkness. On June 4th, 18,000 of them suit up for the jump. They will make the first strike of the invasion. We were to uh, take off on the night of the 4th. That's when the call came out, and we all headed for the uh, airfield, uh, loaded up, got our parachutes fitted, and got ready to load up. But suddenly, the weather, which had been bright and clear, turned sour. 
It begins to rain heavily, and the waves in the channel start rising fast. So everyone is very nervous, and when Churchill speaks of his fear of the channel running red with blood, uh, that we know now was an exaggeration, but at the time it seemed very real. Now less than 24 hours before the invasion is to set sail, Eisenhower has a terrible decision to make. If he postpones the launch, he risks losing the element of surprise. But if he goes ahead in bad weather, the Allied air forces will not be able to get the paratroopers into their drop zones or give the assault troops critical air cover. So General Eisenhower should put it off a day. So they had to call some, some uh, convoys back, and the troops had to sit in these damn ships for an extra day. And the call came to stand down, raining and windy as blazes. Anyway, we were disappointed. We wanted to go anyway. Everybody was pumped up. In Normandy that morning, Field Marshal Rommel is packing for a short leave in Germany. He wants to be back home for his wife's birthday. And the nasty weather has convinced him that there will be no attack for at least a week or so. He orders his troops to stand down from a full alert. At 9.45 that night, Eisenhower receives the latest weather forecast. So the famous story is, is that um, Eisenhower's uh, meteorologist d determined that there was going to be a period on the morning of June the 6th when uh, the waves would be not as strong, when the wind would die off, that there would be a period of four to six hours when a landing could take place. The Supreme Commander believes he cannot leave the operation hanging any longer. He gives the order. Well, this time the word was, it's a go, and it was still raining and blowing, but there was a sort of a window of opportunity over the channel, and it quietened down while we were flying over there. The paratroopers will land five hours ahead of the seaborne assault to seize bridges and crossroads, preventing the Germans from mounting a counterattack once the invasion is underway. As they fly across the channel under moonlight, they can see below thousands of ships steaming toward the beaches of Normandy. Back in England, General Eisenhower can only sit and wait. Dad did write a note that uh, accepted full responsibility in case of failure. Well, I can come pretty close to saying this is the, the landings this morning have failed. The troops have done everything that can be expected in valor. If any fault at all, the crews to this failure, it is mine alone. In the early morning of June 6th, the Great Armada is closing on the coast of Normandy. Incredibly, it has made the crossing completely undetected. The horizon is on sea, it's at, what, 12 miles, I think? And I would suggest that maybe we could see, as far as we, we could see the 12 miles, we could see ships behind us, in front of us, both sides, ship ships. 15 miles offshore, the Armada spreads out to cover the 80-kilometer long landing zone. On the west of the invasion front are the two American beaches, codenamed Utah and Omaha. On the east, the British will land at Sword and Gold Beaches. Between them is the Canadian target, Juneau Beach. As dawn breaks on the morning of June 6th, many of the German defenders still don't know what's coming.
Then, just after 5.30, the fleet opens fire. see so many ships, so much fire and so much noise, we thought, my God, they must be destroying 10 miles in, you know. We thought, oh, it's going to be a soft landing, yeah. That's what we were told, it would be, that when we went in, everything would be flattened, but uh, they were sadly mistaken. It was far from being flattened. On Juno Beach, nearly all of the German bunkers survived the bombardment. Still very much alive are 70 heavy guns, more than two dozen machine guns, and at least that many mortar pits. The beach will have to be won by the infantry. The first of the landing craft begin churning towards shore at 6.30 in the morning. For most of the 2,400 Canadians in the first wave, the run-in is the longest hour of their lives. Myself, I kept thinking back about what to expect when you hit the beach. And I didn't think that, I'm, most of us, I didn't think we were going to get off the beach. I was sick as a dog. I was one of the ones on the the deck at the back and uh, I started to slide off and I remember thinking I don't give a damn. And as soon as we get near shore we had to get down. You know we're getting closer closer. And then the barge hit. One guy behind me in the crafts I heard him say you know, oh God, they're going to let the doors down, you know, I mean, it, it was an awful feeling. The landing craft ping and shudder as they're hit by shell fire. of the Regina Rifles loses so many barges on the run-in, half of its 130 men never even make it to shore. The commander of our landing craft just swung the ship around, around the craft room, and dumped us all into the water, our crew into the water. So we were, we landed with nothing. Just a helmet on, that's all, nothing more. <laughs> B Company of the Queen's Own Rifles misses its landing spot by several hundred yards. And instead goes ashore right under the barrels of the best armed German strongpoint in bernier sur mer Less than three minutes, half of the company, 65 men, are dead or wounded. And you die. You die a thousand deaths. I'll tell you, every time you, uh, the machine guns start clattering around your ears and the bullets are flying, then, and you know darn well the next one could be you. The Royal Winnipeg Rifles and the Canadian Scottish Regiment land below the town of Coursul. It is the most heavily fortified position on Juno Beach. Doors open. But out we went. But uh, went into the water. Oh, I don't know. I was only up to my waist, I guess. But. Uh, Thank you. 
Anyway, some of the guys uh, didn't get very far. The beach was littered with our boys, of course, and had legs missing, and got the shoe shot in the guts, and some screaming, hell, and you know, you can't do very much because you've got to keep moving, you know. The Canadians are raked by machine gun fire and drenched with mortar shells as they race across the open flats. B Company of the Winnipegs suffers 80% casualties before it even reaches the seawall. We were told not to stop. If, a, uh, if a, a man went down beside you, keep going. Don't put a bandage on him. Don't do anything. Just keep moving. Don't stop on the beach. The idea was that the people who stayed around the beach they ended up staying on the beach. If you wanted to stay alive, you got off it. I remember one fellow from Gimli by the name of Stephenson who was carrying a Bangalore torpedo. And uh, something triggered that and it blew him right in half. He was lying there just, just out of the water and uh, screaming at us to help him and we had to walk right by him. It was hard to leave uh, a fellow calling you, Paul, give me a hand, and his leg is off, you know. I said, They'll pick you up in a minute and keep on going. You know? And you're not, you're not even talking sensible because you're, uh, you're just frightened to death, you know. Uh, there's no rationalization, you know, you know do something. You know? uh, that was the hard part, and I still dream of this, you know. Uh, how could we, how could we, let them be in there. Some of them are crying. Above the beaches, Allied fighter planes keep the skies almost clear of German bombers but a few get through. I was mesmerized watching that. It went up. They dropped the bomb from the foxhole. I, I followed it all the way down. From the aircraft, down to where it exploded at about 20 to 30 feet away from me. I received a wound in my right leg, and I think my brains were rattled. Despite the slaughter on the waterfront, the Canadians break through the beach defences in less than two hours and begin the push inland. By nightfall, some Canadian units have advanced 10 kilometres into France, deeper than any other division. But they have paid a price for their success. 1,074 casualties, including 335 killed. The combat teams that landed in the first wave had suffered the highest losses. Nearly 50% of them were killed or wounded on Juneau Beach. First night, when we dug in, sort of like you're finished for the day, you're licking your wounds, you're dirty, maybe you're bleeding in places. I said to myself then that I'd made it the first night and I 
How long am I going to last? They are still vastly outnumbered, and they know the Germans will retaliate with a fierce counterattack. For the Canadians, the fight is just beginning. As dawn breaks on D-Day plus one, June 7th, Field Marshal Rommel is back in command and German troops and armor are pouring into Normandy for a counterattack. On the Canadian front is the best German combat force in all of France, the 12th SS Panzer Division. Their senior NCO officers were experienced veterans from the Russian front or from the Balkans or what have you, so you had uh, a group of well-trained, enthusiastic Nazis uh, who were ready for a fight any time at all, and uh, they were hard to push over, believe you me, damned hard. The 12th SS Panzer Division is drawn from the elite ranks of the Hitler Youth. Most of them are just 18 or 19 years old, and they are all fanatical Nazis. As one Canadian soldier described them, they looked like babies and fought like mad bastards. They were Hitler Youth, SS, and they were the hardest, I guess, and most fanatic of, of uh, all the German soldiers. And we faced them time and again, and it wasn't just that day. We kept running into them all the way through. The commander of the leading regiment of the 12th SS is a tough and ruthless soldier named Kurt Meyer. Colonel Meyer already wears decorations for bravery from campaigns in France, Greece, and Russia. He's made his headquarters in the walled medieval Abbey of Ardennes, just a few miles from the Normandy coast. On the morning of June 7th, Meyer climbs the high tower of its 13th century church to survey the front. What he sees is an advancing column of North Nova Scotia Highlanders threatening the airport at Carpiquet. He decided, probably correctly, that if the Canadians were allowed to reach Carpiquet and dig in, they would be impossible to dislodge, and therefore he ordered immediate counterattack. The Canadian column is sideswiped. The Sherbrooke Fusiliers lose 21 tanks with most of their crewmen. The North Novas have 84 men killed and another 160 wounded or taken prisoner. That night, 20 of the Canadian prisoners are taken back to Meyer's headquarters in the Abbey of Ardennes. They are interrogated and refuse to divulge anything more than their names and rank. One by one, they are marched up the stairs to a garden beside the ancient stone walls of the Abbey. And one by one, they're shot in the back of the head. It's one thing in the heat of battle, killing a fellow who has just killed your buddy. There's that sort of thing. Uh, but the other is when you purposely get a number of POWs who had been captured sometime earlier, you know, hours or maybe a day or so, take them out into a field, line them up, and shoot them in the back of the head. That was the difference. Early the next morning, June 8th, the infantry and tanks of the 12th SS Panzer Division attack the opposite flank of the Canadian front. The 
The forward position is held by 300 men of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles in the village of puteau en bassin For several hours, the Winnipegs hold out, though their ammunition is nearly gone, and they are encircled. The Germans had effectively wiped us out. We only had about nine or ten out of our platoon that were left. Uh, our platoon commander was gone, and uh, most of the NCOs. With the Winnipeg's overrun, the Allied front is dangerously vulnerable. The Germans have an open corridor to split the British and Canadian lines. The uh, way was open for German armor to go right down to the beach. And if that had happened, uh, you know, the D-Day might have been a different story. The Canadians scramble to mount a counterattack. The task falls to the men of the Canadian Scottish Regiment, supported by tanks from the 1st Hussars. And so we got to the start line, and we just got there, the shell started falling, which is or the barrage, it's just in front of you, like type of thing, but it's scary as hell. Then we started to move forward, we were all spread out. And we're moving forward, you know, but as we went forward, the shelling got worse. They got worse. Smoke, fire, it, all, it was all hell broke loose. At 8.30 that night, the Canadian Scottish advanced through the grain fields towards Puteau. attacked over a thousand yard uh, stretch of um, open ground uh, to the village and as long as you heard the bullets whistling by you you knew you weren't being hit so as the Canadians cross the open field they hit a series of hedgerows thick with dense bush and German defenders. We got into the hedgerows, you couldn't see, usually the guy beside you, you know, if it was thick, you couldn't see. I didn't see who was beside me. There was a bit of a ditch, and I'm coming up the other side, I ran right into a German. He scared the shit out of me. And we looked right at each other, and I had my rifle down, he did too. I pulled the trigger first. That was it. There's no reason. You know, it wasn't planned. It wasn't. It was just there. I come out of the hedgerows, and you look around, there isn't as many guys as you started with. Look funny. I felt myself getting blown up. I went, guy eye in the air. Came down, and I'm in the grain. I hadn't even got my rifle. And I felt around my body, and I'm okay. And Jesus, I'm looking for my rifle, and I found it. And I got up again. I only made a few steps, and I got blown up again. And this time, when I come down, well, I had a piece in my back. And it sort of paralyzed me a bit. And I lay there, and there was, uh, God, there was bodies all over the place. For hours, there is fierce fighting in the rubble-filled streets of the village. But by nightfall, the Germans are forced to give up their captured ground. As they dig in for the inevitable counterattack, the Canadians make a grisly discovery. One of our gun crew had lost his uh, helmet in the run, and uh, 
he was uh, afraid to uh, stand up in the trench. So I uh, went looking for a helmet for him and found uh, the four bodies of Winnipeg's that had been shot as prisoners by the 12th SS. Well, they had no equipment on them, no arms and no webbing, just their battle dress, and uh, and they were shot the same thing with the bullet holes through their hands and their head. Same thing. They discover that 45 Winnipeg rifles taken prisoner during the fighting have been executed by the SS. Before the Normandy campaign is over, investigations will show that more than 150 Canadian prisoners were murdered by this German division. I guess people need to hang on to something. And this was clearly an unacceptable event, which was of great importance to these groups, these regiments that it happened to. So it became like a flag. In the next three days, the Germans attack repeatedly, but they cannot break the Canadian lines. The professional soldiers of the 12th SS learn a hard lesson about Canada's volunteer army. The pure shock effect of armor does not demoralize or disrupt them, and therefore they have to think again about the way in which they're going to fight these soldiers who Meyer is alleged to have described as little fish who we will chase into the sea. Well, to paraphrase Churchill, some fish. June 12th, D-Day plus six, the success of Operation Overlord is no longer in doubt. The beachhead is secure, and Allied troops are pouring into Normandy at the rate of 50,000 a day. By the third week in August, the Battle of Normandy is over. One year later, Germany finally surrenders. Germany, a transport plane brings the first of the German war criminals to be tried by a Canadian military court. Brigade... Five months after the war's end, Colonel Kurt Meyer appeared before the first war crimes trial in Canadian history. He was convicted for his part in the murder of Canadian prisoners at the Abbey of Ardennes. The court interpreter reads the charges against the prisoners. During the war, he was the face of evil. He became somebody you could focus on. I mean, Hitler is this very large picture, you know, whereas Meyer is the guy commanding just behind, just across that line. Um, and, and so he became, he filled the necessary space of somebody you could imagine as being evil. And I know that all of us kids who, you know, had fathers who were in that regiment, in those regiments, we all, when you looked at the family scrapbooks from the war, there was always the picture of Meyer being tried. Maya was sentenced to death, but the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. He served less than 10 years. Still standing guard over the beaches of Normandy are the menacing reminders of that day long ago that altered the course of the 20th century. And on this distant shore lie buried those thousands of Canadian citizen soldiers whose courage and sacrifice made the difference at a place called Juno Beach. <laughs> 